our hands to the Lord and love him together. Thank you, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the name of the Lord. I uh, want to say thank you to the Iowa District. Uh, thank you, Brother Williams and Brother Tom and all of those that have been involved. I want you to know that there are no great men of God. There are only men of a great God. And uh, we have come together. We've come together in this place. But we're not just here to have church. We're gathered around a person. His name is Jesus Christ. And we are all his body. And every member coming together can be equipped and empowered to be exactly what God wants us to be in this hour. And I'm thankful for that. I believe there's a prophetic dimension that has been released here. I know that for fact, um, and I believe the Lord has sent me to help you. I'm nobody. I'm just somebody, and you're somebody, and I believe the Lord is got his hand extended toward this place and spoke to me today that he was going to increase the capacity of the Iowa district. I believe, that was, I believe that's what God is doing, and... Um, I, I'm thankful to be a part of that. I'm very honored and humbled to be here. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just a voice, just one voice. And uh, I'm very thankful that I get an opportunity to come and be with you, to equip you and tool you. Men are builders. And uh, God has made us to be builders. And this, this, this body isn't fitly joined together unless someone's fitting it together. So we fitting to do it. Someone say amen. amen. Praise God. I just thank God for what he has been doing already in the Iowa district. I want to minister what God has brought me to minister here. I don't want to take a ton of time. You're full of meat, um, and that's a challenge. And you've been golfing, and you've been out all day, and it's been hot. But I just have a feeling that you're going to tap into what the Holy Ghost is wanting to do. Because I sense that from you. The gift of faith is in this place moving already. And... Um, but Brother Spicer, I can't get past it. I was going to tell you uh, after uh, the service, but while I was over here, I just felt like I needed to say this just now. I was going to hold it, but I had a vision of you here a little bit ago, and I saw you standing, and there was a stone wall that was coming down. And uh, the Lord told me he thinks it's coming up, but it's not coming from where you think it's coming down from heaven. It's the will of God. And that it was thick, and it looked permanent, but there was a gap because it only came down so far and it didn't stop you. And you actually moved out from it. And when you did, the Lord told me there was a transition in your ministry. And you lifted your hands and there was oil on both hands. I said, Lord, what is it? And men who had been touched by other men and were not changed, the Lord said he thinks, he thinks permanent changes are happening but I'm actually transitioning him because of the stewardship of the love of God in your life. You are going to touch men that other men have touched and never got healed, delivered, and set free. Your ministry is changing. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. We praise you. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. Thank you. Uh, the, Lord, the Lord just quickened me tonight to share with you something. And, I'm going, and this is a prophetic word for this district, but it's not for any one individual. It's for the entire district. The Lord told me that he did 37 miracles in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But not to get so excited about that except for the fact that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament books. Jesus was born of a woman under the law. The New Testament didn't start until the shedding of his blood after the death, the burial, and the resurrection. So if we understand that the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Old Testament, it changes your dynamic for a particular reason. Galatians 3 says that the Old Testament is a shadow of things to come. That means that the body of Jesus Christ in the New Testament is only a foreshadow of the body of Christ in the New Testament. Which means that if he did 37 miracles that touched all seven systems of man, the neurological system, the, the, the skeletal system, he touched the blood system, he touched the endocrine system, the kidney system, he touched the brain, he touched all three tenets of man, his body, his soul, and his spirit. He, he worked things in every dimension of man because God is love and God came as a man Jesus Christ and it was love I said it was love hear me when you come together in the love of God then the restoration of miracles in manifestation that what Jesus did in his physical body will happen through his spiritual body which is his church in the name of Jesus Christ I speak to you that the love of God would be increased in every heart and that no division would would be able to penetrate what God's prophetic word has been to this district. In the name of the Lord, we resurrect love for the outflowing of the manifestation of the body of Jesus Christ. Come on, if you receive that right now, receive it into your heart. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My goodness. My goodness. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I was, um, I haven't heard from my district superintendent in a couple of months. And uh, today he called me on the phone. He asked me, where are you at? I said, I'm in Iowa. And he said, send a message. I said, what's that? He said, I've heard from the Lord. I said, you have? He said, yes. He said, I just want you to tell Brother Williams that the Kansas district is behind you 120%. And he just wanted to know he loves you. That's what he told me to say. I said, I'll say it just like that. Praise God. I'm going to tell you what. The love of God can fix anything in any situation. You hear me right now? I don't care what it is. The love of God can fix any situation. Love keeps no record of wrongs. That means until you do me wrong, you don't know if I love you. Love is not puffed up. Love doesn't boast. Love thinks no evil. So until you do something questionable, you don't know whether or not I love you. Love is patience. Love is kind. If love is patience, patience is what love endures, and kindness is what love gives out. So until I have to be patient with you, you don't know if I love you. Until I have to be kind to you, you don't know that I love you. Are you hearing me right now? And the Lord is baptizing this district with a dimension of love. Wait a second, I'm not done. Let me tell you. Now, I have not talked to anybody, but I'm feeling something in the spirit. But I'm here to tell you, you're on this side of the divide. Are you listening to me right now? Because, uh, did you hear me? Until there's wrongdoing, then love cannot be perfected. Unless you, unless you have weaknesses and shortcomings, how do you know God's even patient or kind with you? 
And the moment you're perfect, you become God. You can't become God, so you get God's nature, which is love. So love is patient and love is kind. So until someone does something that deserves long-suffering, you don't have any idea whether or not the district is filled with love. So listen, unity is, and I, this is a word for this district, unity is not the absence of trouble. Unity is the presence of of love. That's what it is. Unity is the presence of love, not the absence of trouble. And matter of fact, let me tell you something. What the Apostle Paul said, it is necessary that divisions come. Oh, wait a second. Then why am I working so hard to keep it from happening in my church? No, 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 no. No, let them come because you know what? That's how you know when people love. Love can only be perfected in the opportunities to manifest the love of God. And if you haven't learned to receive the love of God, then you're so miserable you don't know how to treat people when they're messed up. So you got to learn to be patient with yourself and you got to be kind to yourself because God is patient with you and God is kind to you. I told one brother, I choose to love what God loves, and I choose to hate what God hates, and he loves me. So I choose to love myself. He said, well, that's selfish. No, I didn't say selfish love. I said self-love because the Bible said that everything that God wants to do, which is the kingdom, everything he wants to do is hung on two commandments, and that is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your brother. But wait a second. Love your brother as you Love yourself. Is it okay to love yourself? You better believe and you better love yourself. You better. Come on. That means that when you're learning and you're growing and you're being transformed, I'm here to tell you right now, Billy Cole didn't die perfect and you're not going to die perfect. But he did die in Christ. He had a to-do list he never got done. And guess what? When you croak the joke, you're also going to have a to-do list you didn't get done. And the Bible says that we're going to stand boldly with confidence before the throne of judgment. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, there was a, a lot of people that told me, if you mess up and the Lord comes in the next second, you're going to hell. You ever heard that? I got news for you. No, you're not. I got news for you. No, you're not. You're hidden in Christ, and you're complete in Him. And so, therefore, you are approved of God, and you're growing in Him. And as long as you are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So when Jesus gets condemned, then you'll get condemned, and He's not getting condemned. And you are in Him. That gives you permission to grow. That gives you permission to mature. That gives you permission to step up. It also gives you permission to mess up because that's when God meets you with his love. And if you never mess up, you don't know his mercy. And if you never mess up, then you are equal to God. And you're not equal to God, but you're in Christ. Are you listening to me right now? Praise God. The first thing we have to understand as men is our identity. And if you don't understand who you are, then you won't understand what you were made for. And anything you misunderstand, you eventually misuse. Don't believe me? Think of the first time I bought a chop saw and tried to use it and didn't even know what I was doing. That was a fun eight hours. I was raised by dad, didn't even teach me how to swing a hammer so I'm out there trying to work this thing. I have more problems getting out of the box than anything. Then I figured, I'll figure out how to do this. I sat down to read the manual, and it was that thick in six languages. And I would have gotten just as much out of reading it in Chinese as I did in English. I'm here to tell you, if you don't understand a thing, whatever you misunderstand, you misuse. So if you don't know your identity, then you will not manifest that identity in your life. But you were created by God, for God, for a reason and for a purpose. And I believe it's about time that men don't just stand up and get hyped up, but men stand up and get educated on who they are. 
Because if you don't find out who you are, someone else is going to give you an alternative of who you are. And so a man, you know, a man is a man, a man is someone that has calluses on his hands. A man is a, man, a guy that owns a muscle car. A man is someone who knows how to do this and knows how to do that and knows how to do this. And so we, we are trans or we are conformed to the imagery that others uh, impute to us. Not with, Albeit it is nothing like the original concept that God had for man. And so we end up spending our energy, life, passion, talents going after and pursuing that which is is not what God said we were and at the end of the day we're trying to be everything that they say a man is and yet talk in tongues and dance in the spirit and go to church and pay our tithes and keep our seven Pentecostal standards and at the end of the day when we're taking our last breath we find out that it's not what we were originally created to do in the first place and so you have to understand who you are there are uh, there are some original ideas and some original concepts that look nothing like a lot of the things that we say manhood is. So I want to talk to you for the next couple of sessions about the original capacity of man. God created us with the capacity. Now before we talk about that, we got to talk about who created us because we're made in his image. Okay, so we got to talk about the one that created us. So the first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about God. And God said he was a few things. Everybody say he's one. He's love. Okay, he's life. Are you getting that? God is one. God is love. God is life. Someone say amen. amen. And the last thing... And I'm going to put up there is God is holy. Now here's the thing. These are things that he is. He doesn't have these things. He is these things. God doesn't have love. He is love. He doesn't have love. He is love. God doesn't have life. He is life. That's important for us to understand. That God doesn't have life. He is life. So therefore all life comes from God. And all real love comes from God. Okay, this is very important. So God is love. God doesn't have love. He is love. Now, when, when we look at the prophetic, we find that there are several men who were able to see into the prophetic stream. Ezekiel and Daniel saw. They were able to keep their feet on the earth and somehow by supernatural uh, inclination they were able to lift their head up above the clouds into another dimension called the prophetic. And these men who operated in the prophetic had the ability to hear and see and discern the mind of God. Very, very important because the prophetic stream is the deepest, widest, and most consistent stream of Scripture. It runs from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. It is the prophetic. Now, when, a when Ezekiel and Daniel looked into the heavens and they were actually able to see the kingdom of heaven. Everybody say heaven. The kingdom of heaven existed before earth existed. That's very important because there is an understanding here. When they looked into the heavens, they saw something that was very unique. Both of them looked into the heavens and they saw something that was there. And they saw angels around this piece, this unique piece of furniture. And the angels were crying things that had to do with what God said he was. Okay, And so the thing they saw when they looked into the heavens, Ezekiel and Daniel, and th praise God, there was one seated on that throne. It was a throne. Everybody say a throne. Who sits on a throne? And that's who created you. You weren't just created by God. Get over that theology. You were created by a king. And that matters. Because a king has decree, a king has power, a king has a word, a king has a plan, a king has, are you hearing me? He has another dimension that is not of anything that's of this earth. He has a completely different kingdom and he reigned perfectly in order that kingdom. He ha and in fact, it's pretty amazing because the eternal, everybody say the eternal, the eternal determines what is is seen. So the seen reveals what is unseen. 
So everything around us is a reflection of what is unseen, but it's also the shadow of what is coming. That's very powerful. Okay, so here, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. Ezekiel, for example, saw creatures who were around the throne. Now, they are looking back into the eons of eons. They are seen from eternity, and they are seeing these creatures around the throne of God. And around the throne of God, these creatures had four faces. Now, I've met some two-faced people, and never with four face, but these had four faces. Does anyone know what those faces are? They're the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, the face of an ox, and the face of a man. So that means that the face of the ox and the face of the eagle and the face of the man and the face of the lion existed before the man, before the ox, before the eagle, and before the man. Those, the faces of those things existed in the kingdom of heaven before they were manifested on the earth. And Ezekiel and Daniel saw that. Now John the Revelator got to see it too, but he looked into the Spirit and after time had subsided and the prophetic had been deployed and it had been manifested, then he saw the same throne, the same creatures, but the one sitting on it had a new name and his name was Jesus Christ. And he was King of Kings and he was Lord of Lords. So the very understanding of the identity of the one that created you is incredibly important because he is a king. He's not just God. He is king. Everybody say king. king. And so this king ruled the heavens from eternity. This is called the kingdom of heaven in scripture. Now, God who, who ruled the kingdom of heaven from eternity, praise God, ruled the kingdom of heaven from eternity, decided he had a purpose. This is what I call the eternal purpose. Now, we don't ever hear of this eternal purpose because we often overlook it. We overlook it because our focus is not often on kingdom, but our focus is on church. Okay? And because we so focus on church, we lose sight of the kingdom. Well, Jesus' first message in Acts chapter, or Mark chapter 1 was the kingdom of God. His last message in Acts 1 was the kingdom of God. He spoke on it over a hundred times. And when he died, was resurrected, he took his disciples into a mountain and for 40 days in his resurrected body taught them a Bible school series that I would have loved to have been a part of. I don't have the curriculum for it, but I do know the title of the sermons or the messages and the decrees that he made. And the Bible said, and he taught them the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So the fact is, is this kingdom is incredibly important because it's a kingdom of heaven. And God, through his eternal purpose, and Paul mentions this three different times in his writings, he talks about the eternal purpose of God. That God had a purpose from eternity. And so if you have eternity over here and eternity over here, in the middle of eternity, you're going to find a small piece called time. And we are locked in time. But our purpose is for the eternal purpose. Okay? Our purpose is for the eternal purpose. So God said, this is what I want. This was his eternal purpose. He said, I am going to... I am going to make a creation on the earth. I'm going to create or make a creation. That's pretty good. Okay. He's, that's pretty round, ain't it? Ah, thank you very much. So this is what God says. He says, I am going to create a creation. And this creation that I'm going to create, that's your wife, not mine. This creation that I'm going to create he said, I am going to put my life in them. I'm going to put my nature in them. I'm going to give them my authority and my dominion. Okay? And I am going to have them extend my kingdom. I am going to have them extend my kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, onto the earth. This was God's eternal purpose that he would have a creation that he could extend his kingdom onto the earth through that creation. 
Well, here's the thing. God's, God is life. God is life. This is so incredible. It's important to understand. He's not just life. He's God life. There are many words for life in the Bible, but the word Zoe is the word for God life. It's divine life. So all life comes from him. So you have many different dimensions of life. Just in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you have seven dimensions of life. And every form of life has a consciousness. Am I right? I mean, f- plants have a different life than animals. Okay? Animals have a different life than other things. And so you have fish life, you have plant life, you have human life, and there's just kind of these different consciences. An animal has a different conscience than a human. A different consciousness. Is that right? Okay, and so God says, I want to put my consciousness in the supreme creation that I make. He is going to be the supreme creation. I want to put my consciousness in him, so I have to put my very life into him. Everything that I am has got to go into that creation, or he cannot carry my nature. He cannot operate in my character. He cannot move through my authority, and he will not have what is called dominion. Dominion is king's domain. That's what dominion means. My my domain will not be extended into the earth if they don't have my life. Now, when we teach home Bible studies, we always jump first to Adam and Eve, and we jump to them at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because what our intention is, is to let them know that you're a sinner, Man fell, man is in sin, and therefore because man is in sin, he needs a savior. We focus on this, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we skip the very most important thing. Because in the garden, there was another tree. And God told Adam and Eve, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to pour myself into a tree. And you are going to eat of that tree. And when you do, the tree of, the, of life is God in a receivable form. It's the only way I can get them. So God literally created man with a mouth to be able to receive the life of God. And if you will eat of the tree of life, then my life will be in you. And once my life is in you, then you will walk with my voice in the garden. And when you walk with my voice, you'll have my life plus my voice, and that will give you dominion. Now, what happens is, we, we, Adam and Eve, you know what they did. They decided to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you understand what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is? Good is right. Evil is wrong. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the law. The knowledge of what is right and wrong. Well, the fact is, it's not a bad tree. God did not create the tree of life and Satan the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But it wasn't the correct tree. It still is not the correct tree. So when people come to God and they receive the life of God and they actually eat of the tree of life, guess what? We shouldn't rush them to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to tell them this is right and this is wrong and this is right and this is wrong and this is right and this is wrong. We take them to the author of life and we tell them eat from this tree and keep eating 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 from this tree and this tree tree right here has all you need. It has the nature of God. It has the authority of God. It has the power of God. It has the mind of God. It will take you to the voice of God. You need the life. Because that's God's eternal purpose. His purpose is that his creation would carry his life and his nature and his authority. Because here's what we have a problem. If we get people here... 
and they eat one time from the tree of life and then we rush them over to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and give them seven Pentecostal standards to live by, they're going to do everything because of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're going to do it because you told them to do it. They didn't get it from the life of God. Are you listening to me right now? Oh, hey, I said you, you take them to the voice of God. What's the voice of God? We have the rhema and we have the logos. You teach them how to hear from the Lord Jesus Christ that's living on the inside. And you show them how to walk with the Lord by opening up the scriptures and fellowshipping with the word who is Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me right now? I promise you that if you teach them to eat from the tree of life and walk with the voice of God, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah, which is a prophecy about the, uh, the forthcoming baptism of the Holy Spirit, a prophecy which many of us do not care to participate in, nor to recite, nor to allow you to remember, and that is that in that day I will be in you, saith the Lord, and I will put my law in your inward parts. Just wait a minute and watch what he says here. You've got to help me out here and don't cut me down. Don't shut me off and don't cut down. Listen, just just chill out for just a minute, okay? Uh, just, we'll just hold back. Don't be mad at me when I say this. But this is what he said. He said, and I'm going to be in you, and I'm going to lead you, and I'm going to guide you, and you're going to be my people, and I'm going to be your God, and you will have no need that any man should teach you. I'm, listen, that's in the Scripture. That is a prophetic word. Now, is there a place for teachers? You better believe it. You better believe it. And guess what they're teaching? They're teaching you what they're getting when they eat from the tree of life. But guess what? That's, that's called body life. But what are you going to do when you're by yourself and you don't have a preacher and you don't have a teacher and you don't have a Sunday and you don't have a Wednesday? What are you going to do? I'll tell you what you're going to do. When you're baptized in Jesus' name, you're baptized into Christ. When you have Christ in you, that's the Spirit of Christ inside of you. So guess what? Jesus Christ is your cornerstone. You're now planted in Him. You're established in Him. You're in Him. He's in you. He said, if I abide in you and you abide in me, you're going to bring forth much fruit. Learn to hear from the Lord. Learn to seek the Lord. This is your original capacity. This is your original capacity. It is not a freakish thing for sons to talk to their fathers. It's exactly what Adam was. He was the son of God. Look at Luke chapter 1, very last verse. You're going to find it in there. He said, and this one and this one was son of this one. This one was son of that one. This one was son of this one. This one was son of that one. And the very last one says, and Adam, which was the son of God. He was the offspring of God. That's what he was. And he had an opportunity to be filled with the life, to drink from the river and rest in him while he listened to the voice of God. And because of that, he had dominion. Be very, very very careful preaching about power without preaching about Jesus Christ and the life of God that's supposed to be in you. I want to say this. God is love. Everybody say is love. The greatest holiness standard is love. Come on. You want to preach on holiness? Preach on love. You hear me right now? Love will make you forgive. Love will make you be like God. I said love will make you be like God. Everything. See, what we want to do is we want to jump over the means and get to the end. And we want to tell people how to live the life. That's the tree of the knowledge of evil. Back up and get them to the means. And he will take them to the end. He won't ever do it by giving them a list. That's what parents do. Do this, don't do this. Do this, don't do that. Hey, no, don't be that. Live by love. And if you have relationship, then you have the ability to shift and navigate someone into any arena that you want them to be because that's the capacity of man you are more than just a toddler in a daycare that has to be told what to do and when to do it you have the ability to see the Lord hear from the Lord talk to the Lord smell his word touch him behold him fellowship him There is one mediator between you and God, and that is Jesus Christ, not your pastor. 
You say, well, you're cutting down pastors only if he thinks he's the place of Jesus Christ. He's there to guide you. The word pastor means shepherd. That's the exact definition of the word pastor is shepherd. Are you hearing me right now? You know what a shepherd is? A shepherd is there to care and to nurture, to protect, and to guide from the front. That's what he is. And I, and I know right now there's a lot of shepherds in here that wish that was their role description. Because they're not God and they don't want to be God. They really want the relief of the pressure of all the men of God standing up to their original capacity. Standing up in your original capacity. Everybody say original capacity. This is so important. See, because your genesis is not your origin. You were born maybe in Iowa, but you were not conceived in Iowa. You were conceived in the mind of God. This is your origin. That is your genesis. In other words, you can be born in this world, and I said the world because that's a system set up by Satan which leaves God out, which is the world. It's a system on the earth right now. And you were born into that world with your back to God. And you learned and you were hurt and you were damaged and you were done wrong. And you had people that ill-equipped you. And you were born in sin. You were conceived in sin. You were born in a world that leaves God out. You were raised up in those patterns. The wolf and the warp and the weaving of all that fabric was put into you. But that's a good news because that's not your that's not your origin. That's just your genesis. Because there is a eternal purpose of God that he whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to become the sons of God. That's what God wants you to be, the son of God. That's why you didn't come to God. He came looking for you. Why he came out of his eternal purpose. He created this whole thing to come looking for you. And before he could get a hold of you, he had to restore you back. And before he could restore you back, he had, listen, he had to fulfill his own plan to make a way for your original capacity to be empowered. You have an original capacity. An original capacity. I'm a son of God. I belong to a king. That makes me a prince. I hear from him. I walk with him. I have his authority. I have his nature. I have his dominion. I have his power. This was the life of Adam. In fact, this was done in the Garden of Eden. The word Eden means the presence of God. It's also translated the gateway to heaven. That's what the word Eden means. Very important to understand that because God created man and then put man in his presence. Man was not created in God's presence. The Bible says the Lord God planted a garden east of Eden and then the Lord God put the man in the garden. In fact, the garden would not even produce anything. Until man was in it. It was a mud ball with seeds in it. Can we prove it? The Bible says the Lord God planted a garden east of Eden. And no herb brought forth after its kind. Nor did anything spring forth. Nor did the Lord God allow the dew to fall upon the garden. For there was not a man to keep it. Until man steps into his original capacity. He, nothing can grow or multiply. So if I was the devil, and I'm not, but if I was, I would endeavor to keep you occupied. I would keep you filled with something else other than the original capacity. Because if you are not in God's original order, then guess what's going to happen? You'll never produce what God created you to produce. I'm going to tell you that God... God created you with an original capacity. This is, this is your origin. Everybody say, my origin story. That's where your story really begins. It didn't start here because of the fall of man. So it started in the world, but God from his eternal purpose 
then came to rectify it so that you could be restored back to what the original Adam had. So if you want to know what the second Adam gives us and what he recuperated, you have to figure out what the first Adam lost. I'm talking to you about what he lost so you can understand what you get in Jesus Christ. This is the eternal purpose. Very, this, is, this is so amazing to me. I love this. I love this. In fact, we know that, we're, we know that there was an original man. After all this stuff gets messed up, through the transcourse of time. There are some Pharisees in Mark chapter 10 that ask Jesus a question. And they say, can man divorce his wife for any reason? So the question of the divorce comes up. But when Jesus answers the question, <coughs> he never even answers their question. Yeah, this is what he, but this is what he says. What he says is very important. He says, <coughs> Have you not read that from the beginning? Everybody say in the beginning. It's right here. He said from the beginning, God made them male and female. And what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. In other words, what he was saying is, if a male and a female are like the male and the female from the beginning that's what God joins together and if you join those together no one can separate it what he is saying is you got a lot of divorce going on because you have people who are not walking in their original capacity are you hearing me right now so it's important to understand that first man very important to understand because that's the man God made. So when you look at this and understand that man, the word man, everybody say man. Amen. It comes from the Hebrew word ish. And that word actually means spirit man. Man is a spirit. Now the human, the human is a mystery. Okay, the human is a mystery. Man is a spirit, okay? Man is a spirit. God takes the man, Genesis 126 said, let us make man in our image. God made man. That means man is spirit. Now we also know that God is spirit. So God from his self, that's his very life, makes man. Man is a spirit. And then God takes the man and puts him in a body. Very important, and I've, and I've said some of this here before, but I confirm with the Lord that I needed to repeat it. So God takes the spirit, puts it in a body. The word body comes from the word humus, <coughs> which is a dirt vehicle. So God takes the spirit being, man, puts it in a body, humus. So he's, uh, you are not a body with a spirit. You are a spirit with a body. You are a humus man, which is where we get the word human. Okay? It was to the human that God said, I give you dominion. So a spirit without a dirt body. God did not give dominion to spirits, and God did not give dominion to the body. He gave the dominion to a spirit being in a dirt body. Therefore, any spirit without a body is illegal on earth. That's why when you die, you got to go. Okay? <laughs> you, ain't nobody st you ain't sticking around here. Now, there are familiar spirits that familiarize themselves with you. That if you get somebody dancing goo-goo around a crystal ball, you might get to hear your familiar spirit. That's why the one that pulled up the king. Pulled up the king yeah? What well, the Bible says, she was a worker of what? Familiar spirits. Okay? That's from gypsy tents on the other side of town. Okay, so humus man, you're a human. That's awesome to understand. This is why Satan, who is a spirit being, had to get a body, the serpent, in order to do legal business with Eve. Why didn't God step in when he saw that happening? Because God is spirit. 
And if God didn't have a body, he was illegal on earth. He had already given dominion to the human. God can't violate his own will or we can't trust him. However, when Satan did business with Eve and circumvented this, he forgot one thing. God was the one that created all things by his word and God can still talk. This is the prophetic. It's the first prophecy in scripture, Genesis chapter 3. He looks at Satan and says, you think you got me one over on me, you joker, because you went and got a body and did legal activity with them. But I got news for you and the first prophecy comes forth and it is I'm going to get me a body, and when I do, you're toast. And that's why the Bible says, to wit that God was in Christ, spirit, in flesh, reconciling the world to himself for his eternal purpose. So that his nature, authority, and his dominion would be extended on the earth again. And it would come through Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the second Adam. My boy, that's gooder than good. My goodness, I'm ready to eat some Pringles. I, I don't know why I said that, but they sound good. This is, all, this is so important for us to understand that there's an original man and an original woman that have a capacity. So when God takes Adam, and, and, and he names this man Adam, when he takes Adam, who is a human, the first thing he does is he puts Adam into his presence. Now that's important because this is a pattern in Scripture. What God does is he always creates the atmosphere, everybody say the atmosphere, and then he creates the thing, he puts it in the atmosphere, and it thrives. He created the dirt, then he created the plants. Put the plants in the dirt, and they thrive. He created the water, then he created the fish. He took the fish, put them in the water, and they thrive. He created the firmament, and they created the stars. He put the stars in the firmament, and they thrive. He created Eden, the presence of God. Then he took the man, put him in the presence of God, and he thrive. What happens in the inverse? Take a plant out of the soil it happens, it malfunctions and then it dies. Take a fish out of the water, it malfunctions and then it dies. Take a star out of the heavens, it malfunctions and then it dies. Take a man out of the presence of God and he malfunctions and he beats his wife and he acts like a fool and he goes off and conforms to the capacity of what the world says a man is. But when a man has the presence of God, he can walk with the voice of God and he can fulfill the kingdom of God on the earth. Original capacity. Someone shout original capacity. He tells Adam, Adam, you need to work. This is the first Adam. He says, I want you to work. That word work has three definitions, and I'm moving very quickly, but I'm going to give you a whole bag of seed before we leave this place, and I'm hoping not to sound like an auctioneer before I finish. The word work has three definitions in the Hebrew. You have to understand that in the Hebrew, see, Greek, when you ter- interpret the Greek, Greeks, they, ha- they have attitudes, Okay. I know a little Greek. He owns a restaurant in the town where I live. Okay? But when you look at the Greek, the Greek always portrays an attitude, whereas the Hebrew always portrays, portrays a picture. Okay? Very important to understand. So you can have one word that has many different pictures to it depending on the context. There are three pictures associated with the word work. Okay? Now, the first one is to discover. That's the first word for work. Now, because the Spirit of God is in him, he's eating from the tree of life, he's been given dominion, he has God's nature, authority. Now he has to have a work, a work through which to expand that dominion on the earth. He has to have a work. He has to have a spiritual gift. It comes by the Spirit. It's created for the Spirit. It happens through the Spirit. And the Spirit, life of God working through him. That is the definition of eternal life, not speaking with tongues. You need to do that, by the way. So the first is to discover. In other words, it's undercover, and you need to discover it. You need to take the cover off what God has put in you. 
So God is telling him, the first thing you need to do, Adam, is discover the spiritual gift that's in you. What comes to you naturally? Why is it that when you walk over to the ground and look at it, you just want to do landscaping? That's because I made you a gardener. That's what I made you, Adam, because I want you to cultivate the earth, and I want you to be the one that has his finger on every apple tree that grows across this globe because you have my life in you. There's no death in you, so you're going to live forever, and eventually the whole earth is going to be filled with plants, and your name's going to be on every single generation of every plant that ever comes forth because you're going to live forever in eternity and expand my kingdom and this dimension of my kingdom and guess what Adam when your sons are born they're going to have a work and when they discover their work then if it's building then everything that's built on the earth is going to have their name on it because they have a work to do and when you look at an apple seed and you tell it to work it doesn't just become an apple tree you take those apple seeds from those apples on that tree, plant them, you get an apple orchard. It doesn't stop there because it ends in ing, it's perpetual. Working, continuing to work. Well, when you're not locked into time because you're living forever, there is no end to your ing because you never stop breathe ing. So you continue to live ing. You continue living because you have God life in you and there is no death. So your work never ends and you don't have limited time. Therefore, you are created in eternal or with eternal God life in you with a work to discover and you have eternity to discover it and once you discover it now you know you have to develop it that's the second word picture you don't just discover your spiritual gift you develop your spiritual gift because the, remember that gift is going to flow through my life my love my holiness my nature my authority my image so you can carry out dominion in that area of work on the globe forever that's pretty amazing that's original capacity Whew. if you knew you could do something right now and never get paid for it but all your needs would be cared for and you could do one thing in the kingdom of God what would it be welcome to your work welcome to your work you see I, I, believe it or not there's some people that would clean all the time there's some people that would cook every single day. There's some people that would minister and teach all day long every day. There's some people that would serve the gift of service. Romans 12 is there. There's some people that would organize and administrate every day, every day, every day with a perpetual ING. They would administrate every day, all day long. Administration does not wear them out. Those are spiritual gifts. Different than the gifts of the Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 12. Spiritual gifts is Romans 12. But you got to get back to your original capacity and you discover your work and you develop your work. This is important because right now there's no Eve and you don't get an Eve until you get this work. See, we, 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 work, we live in time. So we kind of drew it back, redefined it and say, you can't get married until you have a job. Come on. A job is what you get paid to do. A work is what you're born to do. We got to get people back to their work. A job is in time. A work is in eternity. Okay? You die. You resign from your job, but you die doing your work. And so you discover that work. You develop that work. And here's the third word is lead. Now, this is a crazy word, but it is the first word, the first time in Scripture that the word lead is used. And there's not another human around. So who are you supposed to lead? Yourself. Leadership is not about leading people. It's about leading yourself. Anyone that just wants to lead people, you better be worried. You hear me? Because here, here's, here's what's supposed to happen. Are you ready? Here, here's what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to serve others, lead yourself, and take dominion over creeping things. That's the devil. That's Satan. Don't think God didn't know he wasn't there. 
Here's the thing. Lead yourself, serve others, take dominion over spirits. Don't get them mixed up. Don't take dominion over people. Don't serve yourself. Don't lead devils. Are you hearing me right now? Okay? Don't lead others. I promise you, if you'll just lead yourself, serve others, have dominion over people or dominion over demons, when you look behind you, guess what will be there? People. They'll be there. They'll be people. And if you did these mixed up, then you will use your you will use people to build your ministry, your work, rather than your ministry to build people. And that is not the will of God. Are you hearing me right now? You'll create a hierarchy rather than a brotherhood. And Jesus said, This is not about cooperation, this is about collaboration. That's why he took his 12. He was trying to get them back to original capacity. He said, follow me, man. Come over here. I want to show you something. And he looked over at the Romans. He said, you see them jokers right there? The princes of the Gentiles? You see how they rule and lord over one another? You see that hierarchy working where there's the most important at the top and then the someone important in the middle and the de- you know, or the definitely important in the middle and then the someone important at the bottom? He said, that junk right there, that ain't working around here. Do you understand me? And he said, among you, it's not going to be that. Then he took them over to the Pharisees. You see how these cats are working? That's what he said. You see these guys, how they're working? He said, they dress up in their preacher rig. They love the chief seats. You know, their chair is bigger than everybody else's. They love that platform. They love that, They love that. you know, mm, they got the stuff. They love to pray in the marketplace. They love the greetings, he said, the greetings in the marketplace. They love to be called rabbi. Man of God, you are so powerful. They love it. He said, let me talk to you all about something. It will not be this way among you. You don't even allow anyone to call you master or rabbi. He said, you don't let anyone even call you teacher. What he was saying is, you don't even allow this title stuff to go on. You don't look at this hierarchical stuff. Because once there's a hierarchy, then you got to do crazy stuff to maintain the power structure. And this is not about power, and this is not about money, and this is not about sex. This is about original capacity of men to operate in dominion for the eternal purpose of God. He said, so don't you even allow anyone to call you rabbi because you have one master and you are all brethren. Praise God. Oh, is this okay? Is this okay? It's so needed because here's the thing. Everyone wants everyone else to submit to them. But no one wants to take submission upward. We only want to take it downward. And here's what I am for. I am pro-submission but anti-lording. In other words, I think that I don't think anyone should demand submission from anyone. I think that everyone should demand submission of themselves. And if everyone will demand submission of themselves, then everything will be okay. Because it's, I'm anti-lording. He said, you're not to lord over one another. I am anti-title, but I am pro-submission. Okay, I'll break it down for you a different way because that looks like a little hard ground to plow under. So we'll get plowing here. Okay, so here's the thing. In the Old Testament, there are 72 names of God. 72 of them, okay? 72 names of God. 72 names. When you take the 72 names of God... Uh, scholars say you can combine them in the Hebrew and the Greek and all of that, you mix it all together, you water it down, you boil it down, and you come out with a few things that you can sum all those names up. And all those names up can be summed up in these words. Priest, prophet, provider, protector. A king is all four. Priest, prophet, provider, and protector. And these are a responsibility. Everybody say responsibility. By the way, in the scripture, that's the synonym for authority. So if you want authority, you accept responsibility. Responsibility is servanthood. Even God made himself lower than the angels and became a man and took on the form of a... Is that right? The form of a servant. 
The kingdom would come by the form of servanthood. When Christ found out his work, he discovered it, he developed it, he led himself, and ended up washing feet. You're no different than I am, and we are definitely not better than our master. Are you listening to me right now? And so when you look at this, you understand that this is referred to in Scripture as headship. Headship is not authority over. Headship is responsibility for. So when you say you need to submit, what you're saying is I accept responsibility in order to be a priest to you, a prophet to you, a provider to you, and a protector to you. This is Adam submitted to the headship of God and when he was submitted to the headship of God and he understood his work, he developed his work and he decided to lead himself under submission. God said the kingdom of heaven is the mission. Coming to earth, he submissioned. He submissioned. Are you under? He's coming under God's mission. He has no mission of his own. He wants to walk in the original capacity. Is this okay? And so when he comes under submission, now that he has his work, he's, he gets out there, he starts under the mission. God is his priest. God is his provider. God is his protector. God is his prophet. He is everything. All the 72 names of God are right there. God's life is in him. He's eating from God. He is drinking from the river that flows through the garden, which God made in his presence. He's walking with the voice of God. He's discovering who he is. He is developing who he is. And he He's leading himself to do all of this. That's original capacity. And these plants are just blowing up. And God says, you know what you need? You need a helper. And so God caused the man to go to sleep. And from his side, he pulled from his own flesh. He pulled from his own flesh and bone and made another man. But this one had a womb. It was a wombed man. That's what the word woman means. You know what I translate that in English to? Incubator. That's what a woman is. She's an incubator. That's why you better have something for her to incubate. You better be under submission to God. You better be following his priesthood. You better be following his prophetic word. You better be walking in his provision. You better be coming after his kingdom, coming under his protection, under his name, living by his life, eating from his tree, walking with his voice, being in his presence, doing his work, which he put in you to do to extend his kingdom on the earth. Because whatever you are when you get an incubator is what she's going to incubate. And here's the sad thing. When the man just comes, pays his tithes, works the job, jumps up and down a little bit, but never finds his work. So he comes to church, and instead of making it about the kingdom in his original capacity, he makes it about his job, provides some money for his kids, and comes to church and pays his tithes and goes home. And he doesn't smoke, and he doesn't drink, and he doesn't cuss, but he definitely doesn't know what his work is, and he doesn't, isn't developing it, and he's not walking and leading himself in the presence of God by the kingdom of God, eating from the tree, walking in the garden. In the Are you hearing what I'm saying right now? I'm talking about whatever you put in that incubator is what's going to hatch baby that's what's going to hatch if you give a woman groceries she takes it multiplies it makes it better and gives you dinner you give her a word she grows it multiplies it and gives you a conversation you give her a house she'll grow it multiply it and give you back a home you give her seed she'll grow it multiply it and give you back a son you give her tr are you you give her trouble she'll grow it multiply it and give you hell she is going to incubate anything you give her. So you need to understand who you are. You need to understand the love of God. You need to understand your identity. You need to understand where you're developing, where you're growing, where you're standing, where you're staying, what the presence does of God in your life, how important it is. You need to understand what your work is. What, you need to understand that his nature is what's supposed to be manifesting through you, through his life. You need to eat from the tree. You need to rest on the Sabbath. Understand that he is your rest. He is your power. He's dominion. And all of that, if you Give it to Eve. She will become your greatest prophetess. You know why we have so many women incubating pastors? Because they're going to incubate something. 
And if the pastor is the only one that understands what his work is, what he's developing, and he's leading himself, and he's eating from the Lord, and he's operating in authority, he's walking in dominion, he's about the kingdom of God, and the woman looks around and says, I was made to incubate that. Boom. And the man walks away wondering why she's so involved in the church and she don't want nothing to do with me. All of this is the atmosphere of intimacy. Are you hearing me? This is what a woman is attracted to. She was made for this. Are you getting what I'm saying? I hope you're picking up what I'm putting down. One guy said, I hope you're sniffing what I'm putting out. I ain't going that far. This is so, so incredibly important. And I'm about to close here for tonight. My goodness, I have 11 sessions to cram in two days. So important. This is so important. Because now the woman, guess what she's going to do? If, if Eve or if Adam is submitted to him in all of this, then she is submitted to you. The head of the woman is the man. That's not control. That's responsibility. You say, well, headship is a result of the fall. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's pre-fall. You know how I know? Because the woman came out of the man. The woman was brought to the man. The woman was made for the man. The woman was named by the man. All of that is headship. But that doesn't mean control. Now the, the point of the fall is, is that the woman, you will desire to usurp your husband. But he will. He will have the oversight of you. In other words, in the fallen nature... Adam was a spiritual man, and when he chose to eat, he had a spiritual body. He had the body before the fall, just like the body Jesus had after the death, burial, and resurrection. It's a spiritual body, right? And so if you don't have a spiritual body, then what do you have? A carnal body. This is called self. Paul called it the body of death. When he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, his spiritual body turned into a carnal body. And he became self. Does that make sense? This is why when we come to the Lord, we have to die to our self. There's no way, to, no way but to die to your self. Wow. Praise God. So now, this is such an order. Now, this is a story in and of itself. It's a wonderful story. I love it. But to be real honest with you, God is the head of man. Man is the head of the woman. They're working together in partnership for the work which will expand the kingdom as he discovers and develops and leads himself by the life of God who is holy and king, the nature of the authority, the character of God working through him as he submits to God's priesthood prophetic provision and protection so that the kingdom of heaven can come to earth through the dominion of a man filled with the life of God. Well, that's a beautiful story, isn't it? Here's the crazy thing about that. You see that shadow right there? That's pretty blurry, isn't it? Look at your shadow. Is it pretty blurry? I think we all bring up pretty... You can look at my shadow. It, you can't really tell... What color, you, mean, you can't tell what, can you, what color shirt am I wearing by looking at my shadow. Yeah, what color are my eyes? Look at my shadow and tell me. What color are my eyes? Uh, can't tell? Pretty blurry, isn't it? Because this is what's amazing. That's a shadow. That's a shadow. That's a shadow of things to come. See, when you see a shadow, you know something's coming after the shadow. Now, the shadow's blurry, but here it looks so good, even the shadow continues to go on, 
And like God's given all kinds of details that the people standing in time look at the details that were created for time because of the fall. And they're like, man, that's so detailed. We can live by that. And he said, no, 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 no. That's imperfect. Because it's just a shadow. But there's something that's coming. And we got to maintain this because there's a second Adam coming. And the tree of life from Genesis 1 is going to be reintroduced in John 1. And John is going to repeat Genesis 1, but he's going to talk about in the beginning, in the beginning, was the word God said. Are you seeing it? Okay. And you read on, and the word became flesh, and, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in him, the word, which is Jesus Christ, was the life. He reintroduces the tree of life. And Jesus said, if you eat of me. He said, I know. We're going to get you back to your original capacity. Eat of me. Come into my presence. Let me come into you. And then you come into me. And then I'm going to give you gifts and you're going to discover and develop and lead yourself in the presence of God and guess what's going to happen this is amazing and even even the first Adam gives way to a second Adam and the second Adam discovers his work he develops it he leads himself and when he knows what he's called to do And he finally yields in submission to the headship of his father as his provider, his priest, his prophet, and his protector. He says, not my will, but thy will be done. And when he does this, God puts him to sleep. And from his side, he pulls the second Eve which is the church of the living God. And just like the first Eve was made for Adam's work, the second Eve will be made for his work. It's amazing. Blows my mind. But it will only work If we know who he is, that this is about a kingdom, not just church. That we eat of the tree of life, which is Christ. We live by the life that is in us. We stay in the presence of God. We develop the spiritual gift. We operate according to him. We discover and develop and grow up in all things which is in the head, which is Christ Jesus, the, so he, that he, he might have the preeminence above all things and that we recognize we are his body and he is the head and that we submit to him. And when we do this, we fulfill the eternal purpose of God and the kingdom of God, which is the ruling presence of God, which is Jesus Christ, is expanded into all the earth. I'm talking about your original capacity, your original capacity. It is time for us to empty ourselves of everything that is not from the origin. The things you picked up from your Genesis have to be released. Your purpose in time, the things that have happened in time have got to be released because you only have so much capacity. You cannot fulfill the original purpose of God. The original capacity cannot be manifested if you're holding on to things people did to you. If you operate in fallen self, 
You're locking yourself in time. And I got news for you. Don't none of you know what your great, 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 great grandfather's name was? You don't know where he's buried. You don't know how much he made an hour, what car he drove or horse he rode. You don't know how many children he had. You don't know what his sister's name is. You don't know if he had Bubba teeth. You don't know anything about him. And yet one day, he was just like you, sitting in a chair, thinking he had the world by the tail. Because if you take a clothesline and you wrap it all the way around this room and every building are in, the, in this area and every building in Ohio, and that's one long white clothesline. That's eternity. And you take this pen and you go up here and you mark one little dot on it. That's your life. And you get that dot to prepare for eternity. And that dot's called time. And you have that time that by the grace of God, you can come into your original capacity of man. Listen, nothing in time is worth keeping you from the eternal purpose of God. And the only way you're going to work through any of those things is by the love of God and the life of God. That's it. That's it. I had a guy tell me, I think they're talking about me. I said, they probably are. What are you going to do if they are? He said, yeah, but I think, I think they're doing it behind my back. I said, yeah, they probably are. Because eventually we're all acting like donkeys. So what are you going to do about it? Let's say they're using you, mistreating you. Let's say they were wrong. They're flat out wrong. You are done wrong. Well, I'm here to tell you, Jesus was the most mistreated, misquoted, and misunderstood man that ever lived. And even after he rose from the dead, he didn't go tracking down the guys that drove the spikes in his hands. He said, I'm not getting locked in time. I'm not getting locked in time. I'm working for the eternal purpose. In fact, he said, Father, into thy hands do I commend my spirit. You can mess with my body, but I don't give anyone my spirit but God. Don't let people who break your heart break your purpose. Don't let people who break your life break your purpose. You know what the Bible says? Forgive them. Forgive them. Are you hearing me right now? Forgive them. You got to forgive them. Here's the, here's a dimension of forgiveness. This is a wild dimension of forgiveness. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Well, they don't even know what they're doing. What do you mean? It seemed pretty calculated to me. I mean, really? I mean, a garrison, then to the stake, then whipping, then the crown. Someone had to pick the thorns, got to get the right size. Let's do all this, fulfill all the prophecies, rend the garments, break the leg. I mean, poke them in the side, do this, do that. I mean, I mean seriously? It seemed pretty orchestrated to me. What do you mean they don't know what they're doing? They don't understand. Somehow they got outside of seeing the eternal purpose of God. And they did not know. But guess what? Forgive them. If they're doing everything that you're suspicious that they're doing, let's say it's all true. What's your job? Because that makes them your enemy. Love them. Do good to them. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them. Not about them. Not about them. Pray for them. Are you hearing me right now? This is a test. Right now, Iowa is in a test of the love of God. Because the eternal purpose is what's being weighed in the balance. And God is endeavoring to increase the capacity of Iowa. Listen, 
God had something on his mind when he looked at those people in Malachi and he said, there is a window of heaven that's opened up and into time right now. The eternal is going to flow to the earth and you have got, are you going to have room enough to receive it? That was the question of the Lord. Are you going to have room enough to receive what the Spirit is pouring out into this region of the earth at this moment in time? I'm here to tell you right now, you have to empty the stuff that time is pouring in so that you can receive what eternity is pouring out you got to make the call and say I'm sorry even if you weren't wrong you got to pray for them you got to actually do good to them because love is an action word and this has nothing what they did has nothing to do with you it has everything or nothing to do with them it has everything to do with you because you can't control what they do but you can control what you do And you have to literally ask God, God, they acted like a crazy person. Do you love them? And he'll say, yeah, look at Calvary. And you'll have to say, okay, I can't love them with my love, but I am going to love them with your love. Lord, if they ask for your forgiveness right now, would you forgive them? Yes, I would. Okay, Lord, then I'm not going to pass on to you, them my forgiveness. You forgave me. Therefore, I take the forgiveness you have given me, and I become a conduit through which it flows, and I forgive them. Are you hearing me right now? Because if those things are not happening, then the love of God cannot be perfected. And God doesn't have love. He is love. And it takes that kind of love to have this kind of manifestation that produces the kingdom. That's why you can have the church with all kinds of division, all kinds of issues, all kinds of trouble. People can walk in the door, sit in the back, have attitudes. You can have two-faced. You can have this, that, and the other. But you cannot have the kingdom of God. God and do that because the kingdom of God is manifested through the love of God and the life of God which is in you which means you're under the headship of God which means that Jesus Christ is what the kingdom of God looks like on display and so you got to walk in the same sonship that he had because you're going back to the original capacity and if I was the devil I would take all kinds of mess in time and I would bring you the tragedy of disaster and chaos and mistreatment and darkness and issues and trouble and trial and pressure and all of these things and I would fill you to capacity so you cannot receive this but God sent me to tell you a prophetic word release what you have received in time to receive what God is pouring out from eternity the time is short, my friend. We don't have but a vapor. It's going to be gone like that. It's true. A hundred years from now, none of us will be alive. None of us. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. Will you release it to God? Will you pour it out to God? Will you put it in his hand? And will you walk away from it? No need for an apology to you. No need for anything. The love of God and the life of God is going to have full dominion in my heart and in my mind before I leave this place tonight. Because I'm opening myself up for the original capacity in the name of Jesus. Come on, go ahead right now. Come on, just set it. Set it in the hand of the Lord. Come on, ask the Lord.